This is Wally Knox. Welcome to the Political Conversation. It wasn't long ago that industrial policy was a phrase known only to a small cadre of economic nerds located somewhere on the extreme left wing of America's politics. In the heyday of neoliberalism's adoration of pure market economics, it was thought of as a somewhat diluted form of socialism and was criticized as the mistaken notion that governments could pick the businesses that will win. A better definition of industrial policy is government policies designed to foster not one particular company, but to assist whole industries. Hence, industrial policy. But industrial policy has suffered from a reputation for error and waste. Typical of its reputation was the sad tale of Solyndra. In 2009, the Obama administration backed half a billion dollars in loans to a company with a very innovative technology in the generation of electricity from sunlight, Solyndra. The technology turned out to be so different, so innovative, and so difficult that the company went bankrupt just two years later. That created a firestorm of negative press for President Obama. Presidents don't like that, and it cast a dark cloud over industrial policy in general. Now, a bit over 20 years later, with Solyndra fading in the rearview mirror, the Biden administration has been determined to wade deep into the industrial policy area. The three big Biden bills, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the CHIPS Act, fund a multitude of projects. To round up the votes in the House and Senate, 535 people have to have their very particular concerns addressed. So there are some comic aspects to getting those votes. In addition to funding needed semiconductor research, Biden's bills also address the pressing need to fund continued monitoring for extraterrestrial intelligence, such as governing these days. Back on Earth, the CHIPS Act includes $39 billion in subsidies for silicon chip manufacturing on U.S. soil. That sure sounds like a lot, but compare the CHIPS Act funding with that already being invested by the private sector. In one year, 2021, $50 billion was invested by the private sector to expand semiconductor manufacturing. That was well before the Biden bills. The $39 billion in the CHIPS Act will be spent over a currently unknown number of years, but my guess is from 5 to 10 years. So, current investment in one year, $50 billion, is larger than the CHIPS funding, which will be spread over five years to a decade. It's something, far from nothing, but only part of the equation. On top of that, it takes time to get going. One year after Biden signed the CHIPS Act, not one penny had been spent. Added to that is the certainty that some of its efforts will go belly up. No one can invest perfectly. And when those failures occur, there's sure to be someone who will cry, you got it, Solyndra. All of this means that if Biden's programs turn out to be the high point of industrial policy, there is little chance of industrial policy playing a decisive reviving role in our economy. Industrial policy will be a forgotten episode, along with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's a safe bet that industrial policy will only succeed if it's pursued by president after president and Congress after Congress. And given that the two parties have been largely exchanging control of the federal government back and forth every four years since the end of the Reagan era in 1989, industrial policy or any policy can only survive if both parties support it. But don't the two parties completely disagree on every economic issue? Yet for IP, industrial policy, or any policy to endure, it has to be backed by both parties. Can industrial policy do that? Biden's industrial policy programs have been built around the idea of encouraging the development or purchase of new technology. The single purpose of the CHIPS Act is to revive America's semiconductor industry. 
The Inflation Reduction Act, which has next to nothing to do with reducing inflation but had a title guaranteed to get votes, is a massive infusion of funding into solar and wind generation of electricity. It is all about technology, new technology, and Joe Biden says this infusion of tech funding is key to reviving our entire economy. I wanted to discuss these sets of concerns with someone who really knows the issue. And the choice for me was obvious. Rob Atkinson founded the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation in 2006 and has been its inspiration and driving force since then. He has been called on by the Republican administration of George W. Bush and the Democratic administration of Barack Obama to advise them on how best to foster innovation with a focus on new and disruptive technology. The Biden administration's big bills have incorporated many of the ideas first developed inside Rob's organization. His organization has the endorsement of a small flotilla of Democratic and Republican members of the House and Senate. Those include Democratic Senators Chris Coons and Mark Warner, and Democratic members of the House of Representatives such as Susan Del Bene, Anna Eshoo, and Ro Khanna. And it includes Republican senators like Todd Young and House of Representatives members Daryl Issa. Atkinson is consciously building a bipartisan alliance in favor of industrial policy, Atkinson's version of industrial policy. By the way, I particularly enjoyed my talk with Rob Atkinson in part because he caught me being wrong on the facts twice. I count it as a learning experience. So let's hear what he has to say. So the primary reason I want to talk to you is to have an opportunity to hear you explain comprehensively in one in one fell swoop what you think um, the role of technology is in the whole broad question of rebuilding widely shared prosperity in our country. Sure. Well, Wally, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure. So there's two questions. There's what's the role of technology in prosperity and what's the role of technology in widely shared? Let me deal with the la- with the first, the role of technology in prosperity. It's pretty much the only thing that matters to prosperity. Uh, you know, the reason why we're eight, ten times richer than our great, great grandparents uh, it's not because we're working harder. It's not because we're smarter. It's because we have way, way better technology. I mean, that's what people do every day is they, lots of people, they try to come up with a better mouse trap. So, you know, the fact that we have way better technology has been, has led to the growth of product, what's called labor productivity. You know, you could produce a lot more today per hour of work than you could when you're working in Henry Ford's factory. Productivity growth has I don't want to say stalled, but it's slowed down considerably since 2010. And uh, we have to figure out a way to grow that faster. And it's even slowed down compared to the 60s. I'll give you an example. In the 1960s, productivity went up 34% and median wages went up 32%. That's pretty good. That's pretty broadly shared prosperity. So think about it. The average worker, the median worker in 1960, 32% better just in 10 years. Wow. So that hasn't happened now as much as much. That's the key point. Yeah. And then people are saying, well, why? And a lot of people then say, aha, because it's widely shared. Well, I'll come to that in a moment. But the bigger reason is because it wasn't very big. It just productivity has been growing way slower than it should. And if it was growing faster, the average American household would feel a lot better. So that's where it comes from. Productivity comes from technology and the ability of U.S. firms to build it and use it. So the second point is then widely shared. And this was the debate I had recently uh, with Simon Johnson from, he's at MIT, wrote a new book called Power and Progress. And the narrative that a lot of folks who've given up on productivity now hold is that all of the productivity gains have gone to the elites and none to the average worker. And I'm not I don't want to say the opposite because the opposite is not true either, Uh, but it's way exaggerated. And I won't go into the technical details. It depends on what price deflator do you use? Uh, Do you use the consumer price deflator or another one? It depends on are you counting 
just wage income or total income? Because a lot of where we're spending money now is in health care. And that, a lot of workers get health care benefits. It doesn't get counted in wage income, but it's real. So anyway, the bottom line, yes, the average, uh, let's see, if you, if you take the deciles, 10th is the lowest, 90th is the highest. The 10th, 20, 30, 40, 50, they've all gotten richer over the last 20 years, but not as much as the, as the 90th, to be sure. But they have gotten richer, and that's an important point. To A lot of times people on the left say, ah, oh, the working class got nothing. No, that's not true. They did get something. They could have gotten and should have gotten more, but they did get something, and productivity is a key to make that happen more. Um, so you have uh, created your institution, which is uh, churning out ideas on, on what you can do to foster greater, greater use of technology greater research and development in technology. Um, you put out, um, a, what is that, a, a tech policy to-do list um, a couple of years back with 59 pages of ideas. <laughs> you know, rather than going, th- I mean, basically about three <laughs> ideas per page, uh, it is fascinating reading. In your view, what are the key ideas you think need to be pushed forward? Before I answer that, I, I, it is important to differentiate between three factors that get oftentimes conflated and confused. Um, if you think about what are most economists thinking about, by and large, they're thinking about the business cycle. You know, that, you know, you look at any business newspaper today, you look at any business TV show, what's happening to the stock market? What's happening to interest rates? What's happening to the unemployment rate? Those are all You know, if you're trying to make money on the stock market and you're worried about losing your job, those are important. They're not really very important for where America is going to be in 10 years. And so those that question really boils down to three big questions and they're related but different. One is how competitive are is the U.S. economy going to be in global markets? Are we going to be able to go out there and sell our products, create good jobs at home and be able to maintain a high dollar? Uh, and so far in the last 30 years, that has not been the case. We've been losing competitiveness and we've been losing good jobs and the dollars some went down. The second I- issue is innovation. We just want, we want and need more innovation. And that could take everything from having a cure for certain kinds of cancer or Alzheimer's. And then the third area would be productivity. So imagine you have a, you, you have an economy that's really two components. There's the traded component, like uh, Ford Motor Company, Intel, uh, these companies compete, Boeing, they compete all over the world. But then there's a lot of the economy that doesn't compete with the rest of the world. Um, haircuts, uh, grocery stores, dry cleaners, garbage collection. It uh, doesn't really matter what they do in terms of competitiveness because they're, they're going to be here. But w- it really matters in terms of how productive they are. If we can't raise productivity in those sectors, we're going to have a slow-growing economy. So that's different than competitiveness, and it's different than innovation. So to answer your question, it, I guess it partly depends on which of those you think we want to accelerate. But let's just say for the sake of argument, it's productivity. I think the single biggest thing we could do would be to, for policymakers in Washington, to acknowledge, number one, that it's important, and number two, that there's something government can do. I was talking to um, a colleague of mine, Richard Lipsy, who is, uh, he's, I think he's 90 years old now. He's a Canadian economist. He's, he has one of the best-selling macroeconomics textbooks. He's won the, what's called the Schumpeter Prize for Economics and Innovation. Just an incredible man. I was talking to him a number of years ago, and he was talking about his textbook. And he, I said, you know, how's that going? He goes, oh, it's going great. It's like in the 19th printing or something. He said, but the main comment I get from the economics professors who teach my book is, could you shorten it and get rid of the chapter on growth and productivity? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I say that in a flip way, but it's quite serious. Uh, Paul Krugman once said, the economist Paul Krugman, productivity is the single most important thing but we don't know anything about it as economists and we're not gonna do anything about it. Um, I think that's wrong. We do know a lot about it and we should be doing something about it. So that's the first thing. Just admit that it's important. And then you could start going through a whole set of policies we have and say, is this supporting productivity or is it not? And I'll give you a good example. In the 2018 Tax Act, um, which did a lot of different things, um, 
some of them which I supported and some of them which I didn't. But one of the things that it did that I did support is it allowed companies, big, small, medium, whatever, when they want to buy a new machine, new computer, a new machine tool, whatever it might be, under the old tax law, they had to write it off over five years, 10 years, 20 years. And that made it essentially more expensive for them. Uh, and what, the, what that bill did is it said, hey, you want to buy a new computer or, you know, for your blog, uh, sorry, for your, for, for, uh, for, for your podcast, if you want to buy a new microphone and you're a small business, you could write that off on your taxes next year. That was a really good law and it actually spurred more investment. Unfortunately, it was five years sunsetted and it's no longer on the books. So you could do things like that. You could encourage companies to invest, companies and entrepreneurs to invest more in that kind of equipment. A second thing you could do is you could really design and focus federal research and development on specifically on things that are going to get us better productivity. Now, I'll give you an example. I think, and if you, you, you're old enough to remember the graduate when Dustin Hoffman goes to the party in L.A. and a guy comes up and says, you know, I've got one piece of advice for you, plastics. Well, <laughs> If I have a piece of advice today, it's robotics. Uh, it's an amazing technology that'll transform our world, but we need a lot more work on research to make them better. The National Science Foundation has a program called the National Robotics Initiative. Compared to the Chinese, it's underfunded by an order of probably 50 times, but almost as bad, it will not allow any funding for a robot that replaces or displaces a worker. Can you imagine if we had that in the 1930s and Brunswick uh, couldn't couldn't uh, do research on the bowling pin setters because they would put the bowling pin setter boys out of business, out of a job? Look, the reality is we're going to have to have automation. There's a lot of jobs that have to be automated. Um, you know, taking a toll on a freeway. Boy, what an awful job that is. Uh, taking somebody's mortar at a McDonald's. So we need to have a strategy of how we're going to automate more of the economy. And, and of course, we need a strategy to then help workers who are to make transitions to other jobs. Absolutely. But if we can't embrace that, we're just going to have a slow growing economy where our kids are not going to be much way much better off than we are. Well, this is this is an appropriate time for me to, to pitch in and uh, and agree with you um, about the the central importance of productivity. Um but to go back to uh, sort of an, an ongoing underlying debate between, I, I, I maybe I'm characterizing this, object if you just disagree, someone on the, on the center right, such as yourself, and center left, Simon Johnson, Duran Osamoglu, David Otter at MIT, Danny Roderick, Gordon Hansen at, at Harvard, um, all, uh, all that entire group of folks very much agrees with the importance of, of productivity. And, and you began the conversation in a very interesting way, which was to say that um, typically when we think of productivity improvement, we think of terms of machinery that will improve. We think in terms of manufacturing that will improve. It's just easy to do. We've all heard the Henry Ford story. It makes sense. It's so easy. But today, uh, 70 to 80% of the economy is services, uh, just as you were pointing out. Uh, things that China, cannot, China can't cut our hair. China can't do the services that we depend on. But... The services have lagged in productivity gain very, very much so. So I'm hearing a very interesting agreement between uh, economists such as the ones I just sort of listed off there and, and yourself on the need to think about what do we do about productivity in the service sector? Am I hearing you correctly on that? Yes. And by the way, just as a not a, a little nit, I guess, I wouldn't call myself center right. I would call myself center center. <laughs> uh, Good. Lots of things I support on the left, if you will. If you think about higher minimum wage, that's kind of a left side. I support that. Um, anyway, so there's a couple of issues here. One, I think the, there are those all those economists you talked about support productivity, but they really they support it with one hand, not two hands. 
Uh, I support it with two hands. I'm full-throated. Uh, they say, well, productivity is good as if you give a worker a tool that lets them do their job better. That's good. So take the longshoreman. Well, no, good, good example. Take Let's take the writer's strike that's going on now uh, in Hollywood and other entertainment points. One of the things they're striking over is the ability for the studios and other cre- creative uh, in, in, uh, firms to use AI. Um, look, if I were them, I'd do exactly the same thing. I'm not castigating them. That's their job to protect their job. But no, no. If we can figure out a way to make movie scripts 50% cheaper uh, using AI, I'm all for that. Uh, Now, I get that it hurts them, but it helps me, helps you, helps our kids. Same thing with the longshoremen out in out in the port. You know, the, we we have we have a set of ports in the U.S. that are among the least automated among the major port in the world. There are other ports that are vastly more automated. Our ports are not, largely because the unions have said, if you automate, we're going to go on strike. So this is where the economists you talked about are very sympathetic to those interests. Um, I'm frankly not. Uh, I really think those are selfish interests, and I. Again, they're rational. I'd do it. If somebody wanted to have a technology to automate think tanks, I'd be, hey, that's terrible. But my job is not to protect them. My job is to think about the overall society in America and our kids. So that's the big difference. The other, I think, important notion is there was always this view among a lot of economists that services can't be automated. And this is what's called the Baumel disease. William Baumel, a famous economist, <clears throat> said that uh, string quartets took four people in, in 1600. They take four people now. Well, that's not really true. They don't take four people because I can stream it. Uh, so there has been automation. And then the last point I think that's important is there's a real important debate in the U.S. that is about we have a boatload of, you know, frankly, low wage jobs, low wages, not all that interesting sometimes, sometimes boring, sometimes dangerous. Uh, my co-author and colleague, Michael Lynn, just wrote a book called Hell to Pay, which is about what's the political effect of that. There's two ways to think about that. There's a way of saying, well, we're going to give them more money um, and we're going to try to create so-called good jobs. The problem with that is you really can't give them. There isn't enough money to give. Um, and secondly, if you create, where are you going to get these good jobs from? Because there's still going to be bad jobs. It's not like if we create good jobs, um, we don't have to have the garbage picked up. So the best way to help, in my view, to help low-income workers, and I know this is a sort of a radical view, we should be thinking about how do we automate a lot of those jobs. I would love to see every McDonald's and every fast food restaurant have kiosks for ordering. Uh, I'd love to see, you know, in Australia, a good example in Australia, they use automated garbage trucks. They just come by, it's one person, one driver. Although, you know, in a few years, those things are going to be completely automated. You don't even have a driver in those because you'll have autonomous garbage trucks. And they just hook a little hook down, it picks up this specially constructed garbage truck, puts it in there, moves on. I look at the guys, the guys who pick up my garbage and, oh my God, they're pouring rain, cold, snow, lifting these heavy things. And it costs more. So we should be thinking about automating those kinds of jobs and a lot more. The uh, I, I want to push back, if I can, on the, the longshore discussion for a very specific reason. That is, for years, uh, I was a union attorney who represented longshore okay. in a little teeny tiny port called Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach. Um, and uh, so I, I'm intimately familiar with the, the story of, of the longshore. And there's much truth in what you said. And the person who would uh, agree with that truth would be Harry Bridges, who created the longshore movement uh, on the West Coast yep. and was for years the most prominent ultra-left labor leader you could imagine. And Bridges said, um, we, are, we, are not going to stand in, we are not going to stand in the way of automation. And automation will reduce our ranks. We will not be able to have literally 100,000 longshore workers on the West Coast. Right. The longshore workers who remain will live like kings. Yeah. And it's a, it's a famous Bridges quote for obvious reasons in the, in the union ranks. Um, 
So I would, I would differ with you in this way. It is absolutely true. If you go to Rotterdam, Holland today, you'll have a hard time finding a human being. You'll find pl- massive machinery, beautifully coordinated, loading and unloading cargo like crazy. And if you go to Long Beach and Los Angeles Harbor today, you'll see massive machinery, yeah, but you still will see folks operating most of the machinery. I think what the Longshore did and what Bridges did was slow down the transition. Um, and you are right. It puts that section of our economy at a, a disadvantage compared to the sectors that are moving ahead more rapidly. But the argument would be like this. Yeah, it takes us longer to get to quote unquote optimal use of the existing technologies. But uh, in the interim, a heck of a lot of people earn a enorm their, their lives are transformed. Not only their lives, but their kids' lives. Longshore community today um, is one of the most prosperous and thriving groups in the country. And it's fascinating today to see longshore uh, longshore workers who used to be some of the least educated, uh, workers in the United States of America. Their kids are coming into Longshore these days, college educated, but they know where a really good living can be made. Anyway, so I, I have to push back on that sure. from, from the personal experience. There's profound truth in what you say. There, there yeah. is this trade-off that is very, very difficult to understand. Yeah. I was talking, by the way, just to be clear, I, I think unions have a critical role and I what I think that role should be is really working to p- provide a higher standard of living, better wages, better benefits, and better voice. Where I am more problem, where I have a more of a problem was when they resist technology. I was talking once to a Swedish trade unionist leader, and uh, he said a very interesting thing to me. He said, "Rob, in Sweden, we don't fear new technology; we fear old technology." And now he was talking about traded sectors where if these Swedish companies are laggards and they don't invest in the best technology, they lose all their jobs, not just a few. So I, 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 we still probably had a different view on that. But I do think it's a little bit different, though, when you're talking about automating uh, somebody who's making uh, $12 an hour um, as a toll taker or somebody who's making $8 an hour. They're in a pretty low wage job when they transition. It's going to be either do another low wage job or hopefully a slightly better job because you've gotten rid of some of the low wage jobs. So I was thinking principally in that we have way too many low wage jobs and there's really no way to fix that problem. I I support a higher minimum wage that will help, but we can't subsidize our way out of that. Uh, And I think it's I think it's horrendous that people are making less than $30 an hour, frankly. Uh, I think it's horrendous. I don't know how people do it. I'm privileged because I don't, and you probably are too. I do think technology can play a role and can help that, and a lot of people seem like they're resistant to it. So let me go back to uh, the the point we began discussing, and that is uh, how productivity in the service sector uh, will really be improved. I began by saying it's easy to imagine it in a manufacturing setting because for some reason or another, I can imagine that a new and better machine will operate more rapidly and the worker will have to push fewer buttons to make it operate and therefore it has greater productivity growth. In the service sector, um, uh, there's it has there has been much slower productivity growth, if any, and it's harder to imagine that happening. And I think that's why Danny Roderick uh, is kind of taken the lead in saying that we need to seriously think about that. Do you have a contribution to that thought? Yeah, so I think Danny's giving up too easily, and it, uh, I, I don't speculate as to why he thinks that you can't raise productivity in the services. There are certainly services that are really hard to raise productivity on. I think, for example, a nurse. Uh, that's that's a pretty labor-intensive job. There's certain things you can do to help. Uh, but there's a lot of other... I, I think, for example... Um, yeah, so there's a lot of things you can. Here's a few things you could. Lawyers. Uh, sorry to pick on you twice, uh, Wally, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 
You know, there's a lot of legal practices that could be done by AI. I'm not talking about, you know, a criminal case, but, you know, routineers, wills, you know, I've got to do this rent agreement, uh, uh, even divorces, frankly. In the UK, a lot of people get divorced using uh, internet software, and the legal profession is opposed to that. Uh, I, I'll give you another example. There's a company, uh, a supporter of ours, to be uh, open uh, and transparent, uh, called Boston Dynamics. Uh, I don't know if you know that that company with the robots that are dancing in the Super Bowl commercial. They're drinking beer. It's, uh, it's really hilarious. They now have a new robot that can unload uh, uh, w- trucks coming into a warehouse. So you have these trucks with all these boxes. They're super heavy, a lot of back injury. Those robots can unload those. They can do it faster with uh, less damage, uh, all that stuff. That's pretty cool. Uh, So there's more promise there, and it's not just robots. I think AI, for example, will be able to help automate or at least reduce the time that people have to spend on things. So I think we just have to be optimistic uh, and and, and focus. You know, again, good example, kiosks uh, at at ordering. Um, Another one is construction. Uh, Construction is actually one of the only industries where we've had negative productivity growth. And yet if you go and you look at a country like Korea, where they have a National Construction Technology Institute, where they really work to get all the and the other problem with construction is it's it's you got the builders you 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 got the sub subcontractors you got the people with the materials you got the architects that system isn't working together and so in Korea they've had three to four percent annual productivity growth in construction uh, we have zero or negative so there are things that could be done uh, we just have to sort of think about it. Um, one of the things the Europeans have done is they've created, I, I don't know if you remember Semitech, but it was a thing for the semiconductor industry in the 80s. Well, they have a sim- similar thing in Europe for construction. Uh, how to, like, and I, was, I, was, I was at an event, a, a robot conference, and there's a German company that when you, know, when, you re, when you rehab old buildings, you know, office buildings, there's all this stuff you got to take down. They have robots that do that. Uh, they also have robots that lay bricks. Uh, so... Th- I think there's a lot of promise, uh, and I still think there'll be, I think at the end of the day, the end result will be jobs that are more interesting, less dangerous, and higher wage. Uh, I'm very optimistic about that. Uh, so I don't think Danny and those guys think about that, and so they're just sort of stuck with this conundrum, like, we've got all these low-wage jobs, what do we do? Well, we better subsidize them. And I don't think that's possible to really make a, a dent in a serious way. Well, I'm I'm not sure that's the direction they're going. Uh, the the studies they're doing are have not come to conclusions yet. But I suspect Roderick wants to improve productivity in the service sector as as well. I think they would part company with you on the kinds of questions that uh, you're talking about, where um, you need to work. If, if the sole use of the new productivity is to lay off workers. They're looking, I I suspect they're looking for some kind of a compromise, somewhat akin to the Bridges compromise that I sketched for the Longshore. But uh, I don't don't want to speak for them. We'll wait and see what they have to say. Here's what I really was anxious about. By the way, Wally, can I just make, sorry, I think it is an important distinction. Yeah, go. When I debated Simon Johnson, Simon was, maybe I'm putting words in his mouth, but I read his book and I had a debate. It's on our website. Simon really... At the end of the day, he does not fundamentally support technology that puts somebody out of work. I support both kinds. I actually think the government should be agnostic. I think, you know, I, BMW, for example, is introducing robots and other things over in whatever place they are in Germany. But they're doing it as, as cobots, what are called, you know, collaborative robots. The robots are helping the workers and they're doing it so that they can make model changes faster and have higher quality. That's fantastic. None of my business what they do. If they if that's the best way for them to improve their cost and quality for customers, that's their choice. I just think companies should be allowed to, you know, do either. Uh, sometimes it's going to be collaborative technology. Sometimes it's going to be replacement technology. Yeah, and and going back to the debate within within the academy, um, it's not at all clear to me that the kinds of things Johnson, Asimoglu, and Roderick are, are seeking are uh, f- government regulations that impose, um, re- you know, that requirements on the use of technology and exclude it elsewhere. Um, the well, to be fair, 
what Asagam, what Asagamblu has proposed, Asamoglu, Asamoglu, yeah. and I don't know if it's in the book with Simon. He, because I've de- I debated uh, uh, him uh, at ITF a couple of years ago. He wants a tax, like yeah, he doesn't want to regulate it, but he wants to tax it. He wants an affirmative excess tax on any automation equipment that puts a worker out of business. So that's not neutral. You got me there. Okay. <laughs> Let me change the subject uh, a bit. The Biden administration um, has passed a small flotilla of bills um, with a lot of dollar bills attached and some new ideas. And uh, I, I, gather, I gather from watching the conference that you recently held um, uh, in which you brought in Senators Coons, and and young uh to discuss the the biden legislation and in particular to ask them as people who are on pretty much on the cutting edge of what uh our national legislators are thinking about this where they think it it goes next i got the strong impression that you are deeply involved in the discussions about what the national legislation should be are you open to discussing your role in the the Biden legislation? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first of all, I, I would I just need to say, you know, I, I think we are so lucky to have those two senators, uh, Chris Coons, a Democrat from Delaware, and, and Todd Young, a Republican from Indiana. Um, you know, it's risky these days to work across the aisle, unfortunately. Uh, each side wants to attack you. How can you go with the enemy sort of thing? And that wasn't the way the country used to be. And they've made a clear commitment to do that for the good of the country and support really important and creative ideas to help regrow our industrial base and good jobs. So a um, couple of things. I wasn't involved. We, we weren't directly involved in the IRA, which was the, the Inflation Reduction Act. And most of what we're talking about there were the tax programs and some spending for uh, clean energy production in the U.S. Although we have a clean energy uh, center at ITF and a lot of the ideas that we were pushing, I, I shouldn't say we weren't, we were involved. I, I should take that back because there were some ideas in there, for example, creating an office of demonstration in the Department of Energy so they can have better capabilities to go demonstrate big new technologies. That was that was our idea. But we worked quite closely uh, on the CHIPS bill. This was a groundbreaking piece of legislation that provides uh, I think we have $49 billion to basically recruit, if you will, uh, chip factories to the United States. They could be American companies, could be foreign, as long as they're not Chinese. That's going to be very, very critical, very important. We used to make 40% of the semiconductors 40 years ago. Now we make 12. And it also includes about $13 billion or so for research and development support. Uh, and we were we yeah, were pretty involved in that. The second component was the science part, which called we got all merged at the end into chips and science. That was originally called the Endless Frontier Act, and that was where Senator Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader Democrat, and Senator Young partnered. And there we were involved in a couple of different places, a couple of different ways. One, uh, which I'm you know really really proud of uh, and happy about, is a program that we launched, or we encouraged them, and they picked up on called Regional Innovation Hubs. I, we did a study uh, on that. It was an our, our idea. We did it. We did the study with the Brookings Institution, and what we found in that study was 112 percent or so of all tech jobs went to five places in the in the U.S. in the last like 15 years. So in other words, tech jobs went down in other places, and they grew in you know the typical places that you'd imagine: Silicon Valley, L.A., New York, Boston, Seattle. That's not good. It's not good for the country. It's not good for our politics. So what we proposed and now is being implemented in the Department of Commerce is this competition where places can compete to get support for five and hopefully 10 years to really build up their capabilities. Uh, And just to be clear, we're not talking about places in the middle of nowhere that have nothing. Uh, This isn't about trying to help places that just can't do. It's places that are pretty good. Uh, The Pittsburghs of the world, the Columbus, Ohio's of the world, the Birmingham's, Alabama's of the world with a world-class medical center. I'm not saying these are the places that are going to win, but they're the types of places. And then the last component of that was the science component. And there I have to say, we were quite involved with it. I have to say I was a little disappointed. Uh, what the science component did is it created a new a new uh, directorate in the National Science Foundation. 
called the Technology Innovation Program. And, and it said to NSF, National Science, you're going to focus on 10 core technologies that are critical to our nation's competitive future, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, although it didn't use the word China, things like um, quantum computing, uh, things like biotechnology, things like AI, et cetera. There's more to it than that. So that's all good. Because before that, NSF had you know virtually no interest in this question. They would just fund any, you know, they want to fund astronomy, you can get an astronomy grant. Uh, so this is very important, direct NSF to align what they're doing with really important, critical national security and economic security goals. Problem, though, is in, in the initial version, in the Senate version that Senator Young pushed with Schumer, two-thirds of the money uh, went to this new directorate at NSF. But because of lobbying by universities, because the House had a very different approach, uh, largely because some in the House just wanted to give money to universities, two-thirds of the money go to the rest of the NSF, and only one-third of this new monies are going to this new directorate. So I find that quite disappointing. Uh, our problem in the U.S. is not lack of basic research. We're one of the world leaders in that. In fact, a lot of the basic research we do, the Chinese use. Our problem is applied research and then the commercialization of that and spinning it off to new entrepreneurs and new companies or existing companies. So having said that, we're better off than where we were because we have this new directorate and it's going to be focusing on these new technologies. But where I worry, and this is where the conversation was with Senator Young and Senator Coons, is there's a lot more we need to do. Uh, if we're going to really you know, keep our share of, this, of the global economy and not lose to China, we got to do a lot more. And uh, it's not clear we're going to do that. So, the um, the legislation that you're discussing is is very significant and very interesting. It has come under criticism. Interestingly enough, the most uh, successful critic of it is uh, a person who working for the New York Times, who has a generally left of center profile, Ezra Klein, coined the phrase "everything bagel." to describe a whole hunk of that legislation, everything from the CHIPS Act through the um, Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera, uh, and pointing out that the, the programs that you like a great deal, and th frankly, the nation is wildly enthusiastic about to foster greater manufacturing, to bring manufacturing outside of, uh, and, and research and development outside of five ultra elite and ultra isolated sections of the country to the wider section that's wildly popular in the country but the legislation tacked on uh, a host of requirements every single good idea that a democratic legislator could come up with found its way into the requirements that people must uh, check the box in order to bid um so um, every equity you can imagine must be satisfied, et cetera, et cetera. Oddly enough, the most successful critic of that came from the left who said, you know, you got to have some focus to this stuff. Um, now, you were a strong proponent of, of the fundamental legislation. Do you agree or disagree with Klein? How would you position your, your views? So... Look, if I were czar, I wouldn't have put those things in there. I think the single most important economic, techno-economic factor right now in the U.S. is, I think, unless we change course, we're going to lose to China. It's not a world I want my kids to live in. I really don't. I think we're going to end up like the U.K. If you know the U.K. very much, they got a few companies, Rolls-Royce, uh, Glaxo, SmithKline. That's about it. I mean, I'm over-exaggerating, but U.K. has been hollowed out. They got a lot of, a lot of banks. But I'm also realistic. Uh, we live in a democracy uh, and things get put in there for different reasons. And when you look at it at the end of the day, all of these things that Ezra's talking about, the, you know, the, the sesame seeds and the poppies and the onions and all that on the bagel, how deleterious is it really going to be? I don't think all that much. Uh, you know, a little bit. I've, I've, we've argued against it. We've done federal filings against it. Don't do this. But at the end of the day, I think we're still going to be 90% there. I, I'd like to be 100% there. So I don't think it's as bad as Ezra said. Like, for example, there's a requirement. You have to put, put, put daycare centers in, 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 in your fabs. So like, all right, not very expensive. Who cares? It's like, I wouldn't have done it. 
you, you can't do stock buybacks. Eh, I think it's irrelevant. I, I wouldn't, I would push back on stock buybacks generally. I don't think you do it through that program, but you know, at the end of the day, maybe it's good. So I guess what I would say is that what it reflects is a really an inability for our politics to make up its mind what it wants to do. Because ultimately, there's a lot of people in the Democratic Party who will put redistribution and equity before productivity and competitors with China. I don't. Uh, I, as I said, I'm more center. I, if it was up to me, I'd raise taxes on the rich. I would tax dividends as normal income. I would raise the minimum wage. I would improve education and training. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a strong economic engine that can compete globally and raise productivity, where are you? And I think the left has given up on growth. Uh, I wrote an article for a, a journal called Independent Review, and it was called The Abandonment of Growth and the Decline of the West. And, and you look at a lot of these folks, like Gene Sperling. Uh, Gene is a, I've known Gene for 25 years. And his first book, when he was advising Bill Clinton, was, and I'm paraphrasing, just to make the example, was something like growth with opportunity. And that was a very Clintonite kind of thing. Hey, we want growth. We can't all go to the rich. We had growth with opportunity. His second book during when he was in Obama was uh, Opportunity and Growth. So he flipped it. His last book that came out at, after uh, during the Trump administration was Opportunity, No Growth. So I'm not that. That's not that's not me. I'm not. I don't want that. I want growth and opportunity together. And I worry that the left has just abandoned growth. They've abandoned competitiveness. Oh, it might go to. It might help a company. Oh my God, that would be a sin. And on the right, it's there's still a lot. I mean, the interesting. I think the really interesting dynamics are now among the Republican Party, where they're in a. They're they're not sure what they are because uh, you've got people like Rubio. Uh, you've got people like. Um, uh, 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 Ohio, um, um, uh, Todd Young certainly stood out. So certainly Todd Young, but I, I'm thinking of, uh, of, uh, oh, I'm terrible. I just saw him the other day, Hillbilly Elegy. Um, oh, J.D. Uh, Vance. J.D., J.D. Vance. So there, there are a bunch of Republicans and there's a group called, called, uh, American Compass, uh, that, that's trying to get Republicans more focused on working class issues and growth, uh, and partly role of government. There's still a lot of Republicans, though, who say, oh, this industrial policy thing is Stalinist. Uh, I, I long, a number of years ago, I gave a book presentation on one of my books to a group of uh, congressional Republican staffers because, you know, I'll speak to wide array of groups. The very first question was from a guy and his question was, uh, I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Atkinson. Are you a Stalinist or a Trotskyite? <laughs> because I had the temerity and the audacity to actually say that, hey, maybe the government can play a role in helping the private sector grow. So the Republican Party's got to get over that. That Maybe that worked 50 years ago when we didn't really face competition, but there's too many of them that are still have bought into it. The other thing, too, is interesting. I was asked by the American Conservative magazine to write an article in, their, I think, their last issue uh, and here you are, American conservative, and they were doing a whole series on why we need an industrial strategy. And they asked me to write an article on the history of government role in the economy and to help build our industries. And what you find on that is it's the free market Adam Smithians that are the outliers. You know, Hamilton from the very beginning, Washington, Hamilton, they knew if we didn't have an industrial strategy, we would be a farm community supplying Britain um, all the way to Lincoln. Uh, the railroad, the uh, land, the land grant colleges, uh, FDR. We, you know, we created the Radio Corporation of America, so we didn't want to trust the Europeans. NASA, uh, John Kennedy. Uh, so, you know, we've had a role of government to promote technology development since the founding of the republic, and the idea that somehow that's foreign to the American system is just, you know, plain wrong, and and it, it it's it's troubling that a lot of conservatives still believe it. Well, I, I f very much hope that the Democratic Party doesn't walk away from growth to the extent you, you think it is. Um, it, it, uh, Brad DeLong was uh, on the podcast recently uh, sort of capping off a series of interviews with Asimoglu and Roderick. And Brad's, Brad's assignment, and he did it beautifully, was to point out that um, many of these programs make a great deal of sense, but uh, if they take place in a context of a recession or an uncontrolled inflation, 
none of the programs work. And turn it around, if you can have a macro economy that is growing, thriving, you have an abundance of, of growth and opportunity, all of the programs that the, the left is enamored of um, thrive even more. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's not an inconsistency yeah. between the two. It's a, it, there's a mutual inter, interdependence. We had uh, a Harvard economist, a wonderful uh, eminent economist, ben, Benjamin Friedman, on our podcast, and he wrote a wonderful book. Jeez, uh, I can't remember. something about why we need growth. But Friedman made this really important point in there. He's a, he's a kind of, you know, center-left, Keynesian sort of guy, if you will, a broad generalization. So he's not a free market conservative or anything. He made this really important group. When you have strong growth, the animosities within a country go way, way down because you're not fighting over this fixed pie, which I think that's a lot of our problem right now. Growth sort of is a sort of lubricant to the political system, the political economy. And just for that reason alone, Democrats should be unalloyed proponents of growth, as as Kennedy was, as FDR was, as you know, is, you know, even Obama. I mean, I, th- I think the party shifted a lot in just six, eight years, and it's, it's troubling to see. So one of the key elements for growth is to research and develop new technologies, new techniques, new, new ways of improving things. And the, the government traditionally recognizes the importance of that and gives a tax credit for research and development. You can, you can, Tote up your research and development and literally deduct dollar for dollar from your tax bill. It's, it's better than a deduction. But it has to struggle to survive continually. They're, they're, the debate about making uh, research and development credits permanent is a permanent debate. Um, uh, and, but that's the only thing that's permanent about it, which always struck me as bizarre example of how you can have a policy that's founded for one set of values and cut off for a set of values that are completely opposed to it. How do you say to a, a, a business, confidently engage in really expensive and important research and development this year and next year on the hope, <laughs> on the hope, that the laws will bless you and and give you a tax credit when it comes time, but permanent R and D tax credits haven't have never have never made it across the threshold, and I I wonder about that. Wouldn't you think that would be one of the first things that folks would address? So, a couple things. One is uh, this is one of those areas where most economists who study this say that is a perfect rationale for this because. There, you know, if you're a company and you spend $100,000 on R&D, the overall society gets a $300,000 benefit. That's what's called an externality. So, for example, when they invented the CAT scan machine, the company that invented it made a lot of money. But the benefits from the CAT scan machine were vastly larger. And so that's why we have an R&D tax credit. Uh, the good news is, though, Wally, is actually the 2018 Tax Act did make it permanent, finally. So uh, it now is permanent, uh, which is wonderful. Thank you for correcting. Yeah. The two bad things, the two problematic things, though, number one, we've always had this sort of two things. You can take the credit and you can also depreciate your expenditures. Sorry, you can expense your expenditures in the first year. In in the wisdom of Congress to sort of try to get this under the five-year budget window for OMB, or sorry, for CBO, they eliminated that last year. So they've actually weakened the research and development tax system. Secondly, uh, a study we did uh, by these two economists who studied the R&D credits around the world, before we got rid of that provision last year, we were only 24th out of 34 countries. So all the OECD countries and then Brazil, Russia, India, and China, we were 30, 24th in generosity. Uh, China's two, three times more generous than we are. Uh, it's amazing, you know, these countries. But now, as we've lost that depreciate, we now have to amateur, sorry, we have to amateurize, we can't, we have to depreciate, not expense. We're down to 32nd out of 34 countries. So if we wanted to just be in the middle, we'd have to increase our R&D credit by one and a half, 1.5 times. So why doesn't that happen? Democrats don't want it. By the way, to be clear, there is, a, there is a push, a very strong bipartisan push in the Senate and the House to fix that problem. So there are a lot of members of Congress who know that. 
Um, and it might happen. But if it doesn't happen, it's partly because some Democrats say, why are we giving money to companies? And some Republicans are saying, well, I'd rather just cut the corporate tax rate. I was once on a on a Fox business show uh, talking about this, and and the, my interlocutor was some free market type, and he accused me of being a big government statist, uh, picking winners because I supported the R and D tax credit, which any company, big small, doesn't matter what sector, and can take it. It's not government picking picking uh, one company or one technology. So, I'm you know I w- I wish it was better. That that would be what I'd say, but it is permanent now, thankfully arguably the greatest uh, subsidy and intervention of the government in business was the invention of contract law <laughs> you know yes so the, the government the government establishes a a nationwide bureaucracy of uh, bureaucrats who are appointed for life for for long periods yeah. of time who uh, pour over the contract laws and adjudicate disputes between businesses as to whether or not the contract can be enforced. How horrible is that? <laughs> and and on top of that, they don't just focus on one or two important sectors. The darn law applies to everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Just, you can have a list as long as your arm. It's strange how things that are as massive and pervasive as property law and contract law are in the background and we have fights over things that compared to that are ultimately relatively trivial and it, it i just am astonished by that continually I, I i another way to look at all this and that's the way we look at it is look if you don't have those foundations you're you're not going to do very, you're going to be in decline, not, not, you're not even going to stagnate. So we have to have and preserve this base of foundation, you know, and you can argue that patents are a little too weak, a little too strong, whatever, but we have to have a good patent system. We have to have a good education system, a good contract law system, reasonably good transportation. I take those as a given. It's like, I take that as like a NBA basketball team where, you know, you got a forward, a couple of forwards, you got a guard, you got a center and you practice. That's not going to get you the NBA championship. And if we want the championship, we got to go beyond that. So I think that's where the interesting, more interesting, to, like how should we reform the R, expand the R and D tax credit? We have a program in the in the U.S. now that was an idea that we proposed and got over the finish line called the Manufacturing USA Centers. There's 16 of these things all around the country, and they're industry led. Industry has to put money into them. Like for example, there's one on how do you make uh, how do you make biotechnology in a process way, like a chemical factory rather than a batch, like a beer factory. Uh, there's another one on uh, on lightweight materials. Uh, there's another one on 3D printing in, you know, technology. They're just fantastic. The Chinese copied this. They now have, I believe, 40 of them, and they're putting 10 times more money, at least per setter, than we are. So this is a great initiative. Companies love it. It, it's sort of joint pre-competitive research. It helps them solve problems. And yet, you know, we're not, we're doing it, but nowhere near what the Germans are doing, nowhere near what the Chinese are doing, nowhere near what the Japanese are doing. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast today, Rod. And let me, let me end with uh, just a, a flat out pitch. Uh, and you can see this one coming. Um, I, I really, you know, there's this debate between, uh, economists and, and advocates about what the proper industrial policy should be. We've discussed how that is playing out with, you know, some folks at Harvard and MIT and yourself. Um, and, uh, and it's very clear that you think, and they think, that we have just begun the process of uh, moving forward on, on this area. The Biden, uh, the Biden bills uh, are important. They should not be slighted. But to stop there uh, would be a colossal mistake to look at them and say, well, we did it. It's done. It ain't done. Right. Uh, it, it, it has been begun. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, to maintain it through changes of administration, um, through wild personalities coming into American politics, is going to take a very broad and a very strong um, uh, coalition of everyone who's possibly in favor of it. So I'm pitching to to you and to anyone who would hear. Let's start thinking about how much we agree on, and and work on that. And it's clear to me that you're 
your savvy to how that works in the legislative s- setting. Um, the uh, there are a lot of votes out there that can be gotten by um, e- economists who come at the issue from the left, who can persuade legislators on the left more forcefully uh, than you could, to be blunt, and more forcefully than I could. Um, so that's 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 where I'm coming from on this stuff is to have us pull together on these issues. Yeah, and and on the right because I think if I think if one of the things about this issue which is really valuable and important is it's not abortion, it's not health care. This is an issue where you can, you know well-intentioned, committed patriots who are Republicans and Democrats can have will do come together. Uh, so that's why I think. You know, we need a we need a big tent uh, industrial policy. And, I, and your point is well taken. There are a lot of people on the left who maybe are a little more left than me, a lot of people on the right who are more right than me. But I think there is a lot of ground in there that is very much common ground. And uh, we do have to stick together and push forward on it. Thanks again for coming on. My pleasure. Well, thanks for having me. Great conversation.